and welcome to Art Crime International. I'm RJ and I will be your guide to the ridiculous world of the art market, which is home to some of the stupidest crimes, cleverest forgeries, slickest salesmen and largest legal loopholes the world has ever seen. Although this channel will tackle crime, it will cover topics in the art market in the broader sense of the meaning of crime, uh, but hopefully you will enjoy the more complex legalities as much as the burglaries and forgeries that I will be trying to bring to you on a regular basis. Art Crime International will hopefully be uploading content on a regular basis. I'm aiming for once a month, but this is all new to me and some of these videos involve more research than others um, in a YouTube as well as a podcast format. So the YouTube uh, will show my pitiful attempts of remaking an artwork that relates to the episode. But if you prefer to listen, the podcast will be perfect for you. As a little background for myself, because obviously I could be anybody talking about any of these things and have no background in any of it. Uh, I have a degree in history and history of art, which maybe stands for something, I don't know. Uh, but I have an inherent interest in all types of crime, uh, but I am particularly fascinated with the art world and the crimes, issues and legal challenges that happen on a regular basis within the West, as well as on an international scale. Hopefully I'll be able to put an international lens on the cases I cover, if I can find enough evidence for them. Uh, I'm also learning German and Chinese at the minute, so hopefully that'll broaden me up to a few cases that maybe we don't hear about in the West due to language barriers. Uh, as a side note, all of the research papers I use for my information and where I found them will be listed and linked if possible down below. Also, I really want to highlight this now and issue an apology for the future. I am guaranteed to mispronounce names in this episode and in future ones, so I just wanted to make my apology now. I will apologise every time, probably, but I'm really sorry. English is my only language at the minute, and although I'm getting better pronunciations of names that I have never seen before and understandings of languages I don't commonly interact with, it's going to be a bit of a shit show, so sorry. <laughs> as the first episode, I decided to pick something I have some familiarity with, as I wrote an essay on this subject for university, but as you shall soon understand, this case is more complicated than I remember it being. Uh, so please enjoy as we fall into the tangled depths of the attribution of La Bella Principessa, a Leonardo da Vinci or a clever forgery. Before we get into the timeline of the events, let's take a look at the work itself. La Bella Principessa is a portrait of a young woman on vellum using white, black and red crayon with brown pen and ink affixed to an oak panel measuring 33cm by 23.9cm. For the recreation, as the material pairing for the original work is quite odd, uh, my recreation will be in the, some simpler materials uh, and materials I have access to, uh, which is pencil and charcoal pencil on paper. I will leave the list of what art materials I use down below alongside the research links. When I first set out to make this video, I had planned to split this case into a for and against argument for the attribution to Leonardo. However, as the artwork underwent continuous research for over a decade, with new evidence and theories being argued throughout, I believe the timeline format would probably be easier to understand. The main timeline will follow those dictated by Martin Kemp, a Leonardo expert from the University of Oxford, who is one of the main researchers of Labella and one of the biggest advocates for the Leonardo attribution. We should keep in mind, however, that his book was published in 2018, which dictates like the timeline of his involvement with everything and different interactions he had with different people. Uh, so there may be some conflicting information or evidence from this time versus Kemp's later published and more likely more accurate timeline. Let's jump into it. On the 30th of January 1998, an artwork entitled Head of a Young Girl in Profile to the Left was placed in auction at Christie's New York, catalogued as an early 19th century German school pastiche, inspired by Renaissance works. The work was estimated at between $12,000 and $15,000, which is pretty good for an unnamed work. The winning bidder, Kate Gans, paid $19,000 as she felt it had a quality about it that made me think of Leonardo and believed it was better than its catalogue description. This commonly happens at auction to protect the auction house from being sued for false representation of goods by buyers, which I'm sure I'll cover at another point as well. The winner, Kate Gans, is a gallery owner in New York and has grown up in the art market as both of her parents, Victor and Sally Gans, amassed one of the most important collections of contemporary art in the 20th century, which was sold at auctions in the 1980s and 1990s, netting over $200 million collectively. 
According to Gans, her gallery was frequented by art market masters and curators from all over the US, where she exhibited Head of a Young Girl in Profile to the Left from 2000 to 2007. However, none of these coveted curators or masters ever mentioned the idea of Leonardo as the creator. Gans seemed to be the only one that saw something more, until in January of 2007, when Peter and Kathy Silverman arrived at one of Gans's exhibitions and saw the work. Peter Silverman, an avid art collector, had been bidding on the work at the same auction as Gans, bowing out at his limit of $17,000 and thought he had lost the work forever. After viewing the work, Silverman negotiated its purchase for $21,000, according to Gans, which works out about the same with inflation and everything between the times of them being bought, uh, so Gans didn't really make that much money off of it. Afterwards, Silverman showed the picture around to his respected friends within the industry, who suggested he contact Pascal Cotte of Lumiere Technology in Paris to do a technical exam to hopefully shed some more light on the work using their new multispectral imaging camera, allowing them to see the individual layers of paint to distinguish between the original work and any patches of restoration. A year later, on the 19th of March 2008, Kemp was contacted by Peter and Kathy Silverman to look at a work on parchment put down on old panel that they suspect may be a Leonardo. The work had already been viewed by Nicholas Turner, a freelance researcher who previously held positions in the J. Paul Getty Museum in California and the British Museum in London, a major authority on old masters drawings and the first to suggest Leonardo to Silverman. Nick Penny, an art historian and director of the National Gallery in London from 2008 to 2015, Mina Gregori, a renowned Italian art historian who wanted to be the first to write on the new Leonardo. Guilio Bora, a specialist on northwestern Italian art made in the Lombardy region, which is where Milan is situated. And Adriano Serra, an art historian of neoclassical Italian art. All of these academics are well-respected scholars whose specific interests overlap with his portrait and all believe it to be by a left-handed Florentine artist working in the late 15th century Lombard using silver point, according to the email extract listed in Kemp's 2018 book. This same email also details that a Louisville accredited restorer confirmed that it was definitely from the period, not from 19th century Germany like Christie's New York had previously stated. Attached to the email sent to Kemp was a digital image of the work, which gave Kemp some initial thoughts. It was very pretty, delicate and sophisticated, he was very suspicious of the colour, costume and the knotwork that had been restored, and that it was on parchment rather than paper. Like many academics that have been asked for their opinions on works, uh, Kemp is suspicious as he has had issues with forgeries in the past and tries to assume that something is wrong until proved definitively right. Personally, I think this is the best intention to have when it comes to the attribution of new works, especially ones that could bring about big changes to an artist's overall or the history of a historical period. In June 2008, Christina Ghetto, an Italian art historian specialising in the Milanese pupils and followers of Leonardo da Vinci, as well as 17th and 18th century Lombard masters and collections, published her statement, which can be found on the Lumiere Technology website, highlighting her initial thoughts on the work, before her further expansion was given at an Artes conference and further published in their magazine in 2009. From her Lumiere Technology statement, Christina Ghetto wrote that she knew it was an unpublished Leonardo as, firstly, none of his students were left-handed, and secondly, none of his students were as talented as Leonardo, even though they excel within their own recognisable personal styles. Ghetto also believes that the level of restoration excludes the idea of it being a 19th century fake, and that the lack of prototypes to base the work on shows it is not a copy from the 16th century. For Ghetto, she places the dating of the work to Leonardo's first Milanese stay, which is from 1481-82 until 1499. In her Artes piece from 2008, which allows for the further expansion of her statement and provides us with some of her evidence, Ghetto continues her thesis that the work is a Leonardo. For context of her article, many of the scientific investigations undertaken by Lumiere Technology under Pascal Cotti are underway and have not been published, so much of the information that academics have at this time is from the pictures or the actual work that they may have had access to through Silverman, as well as some snippets of public assertions by other academics. Ghetto was one of the first few academics to publish her findings in a public forum about Head of a Young Girl in Profile to the Left, which should be taken into consideration when analysing her study. In our test, Ghetto makes several points, many which are later corroborated by other academics who view the work. Focusing on the construction, Ghetto believes that the work was attached to the oak panel backing during the restoration works in the 19th century, leading to considerable damage to the vellum and loss of pigment in the portrait. 
The vellum itself is also interesting, as the work was composed on the previously fur-covered side of the vellum, which is usually made from the skin of young animals like calves and goats, and is the inferior side for writing and drawing. This is unusual for many academics, leading some to hypothesise that there may be writing on the other side of the work. However, Gedo does suggest that the uncommon combination of materials on the commonly unused side of the vellum may have allowed for a better finish, as the porosity and permeability of the vellum allowed for the dry colours to adhere better, and that the yellow-tinted background makes a better colour base for the portraits to create a more realistic skin undertone. From the multispectral imaging performed by Pascal Cotti of Lumiere Technology, Ghetto argues that from seeing the different layers of the artwork, she refutes the idea of the work being a pastiche, an artwork created in the style of an artist or period that borrows pieces from established artwork and laces them together, instead believing the work to be an original, as she can see the process of creation by the artist known as their modus operandi. This is highlighted in the preparatory lines, shading in specific areas across the face, and the way the proportions are constructed in the underlayers of the work. This is continued in the top layers, in the complexity of parts of the face, in the construction of the hair tone, and movement by using the colour of the parchment as a mid-tone for the hair colour to create depth. The imaging also emphasises the movement of the artist's hand, allowing for academics to argue that the original artist is left-handed and the later restorer is right-handed, further adding to it possibly being by Leonardo. However, the work even for Ghetto is controversial as this type of portrait is very different from what we know of Leonardo for this time. The material is experimental, the hybrid painting slash drawing slash miniature style of the work is also experimental. Realistically, the fact that it's finished can be classified as experimental for Leonardo, but for Ghetto the overarching factors can be simplified to four fundamental arguments. The style and female typology of the sitter, the overall quality of the work, the left-handed execution, and the self-same experimental technique with which the portrait has been realised. These four arguments, in her opinion, directed to Leonardo and no one else. She makes comparisons towards other Leonardos, such as Head of a Woman from the Louvre that features similar anatomical traits and its construction reflects the artistic theories of Leonardo, discussed within Treaties on Painting, a collection of his notebook entries organised by categories by Leonardo's inheritors after his death, the detail Leonardo's thoughts about drawing, scientific research, anatomy, among a multitude of other areas that piqued Leonardo's interest. I do highly recommend reading through them, if you have the time, or even if you just want to pick and choose different bits. It really does give you an interesting understanding of what Leonardo was thinking throughout his lifetime and all the experimentations he did, um, like when he was cutting up cadavers to look at the way that the muscles and the skin sits in different areas uh, and like to look at the eye and how the eye influences and lots of different things is all very interesting and you can also see that that underlying work is reflected in his actual painting style and drawing style at the end of it as well but it's a very interesting read if, if you do have the time for it. Ghetto is also interested in the formation of the sitter's dress which does not follow the standard ideal of dresses in this period as the sleeve is not attached using ribbons, as is customary, and the triangular slit doesn't serve any purpose. Aside from the unusual sleeve, the knotwork surrounding the sleeve is also of a similar style to other knots that Leonardo has created and used for other projects. The dress and hair of the sitter is also very specific to a certain era, from the influence of Spanish fashion into Milanese families, which dwindled with the arrival of French fashions in the 1500s, which further limits the period of time in which the picture could have been created. For the materials, Ghetto is interested in the history of the use of Trois crayons, which was famously a French style that potentially came to Italy through the meeting of Jean Periel and Leonardo. This style, and the timeline of their meeting, if found to be true, would make this one of the first uses of the style in Italy, and potentially a result from their meeting, which we can see was passed on to his students by the 1500s in their notable works. This possible meeting has been suggested as being an either 1494 to 5 or 1499 with the arrival of Louis the 12th of France with Periel as part of his entourage in Milan. Unlike many portraits of the time, head of a young girl in profile to the left doesn't follow a similar standard for court portraiture as the sitter is plainly dressed rather than using jewels and expensive materials to emphasise the social rank of the sitter and make them more identifiable as well. The lack of overindulgence in material objects follows the ideas of Leonardo in his treatise on painting, where he praises beauty without artifice and recommends that the painter should not use affected hairstyles and coiffures. 
Although we will hear later that many academics have an issue with the style and form of the sitter in this portrait, Ghetto argues that although this portrait may not seem to fit into the portrait experimentations that we know of by Leonardo, as seen in works like Lady with an Ermine, where the sitter is painted in a moment of movement rather than in a more static three-quarter bust or profile like the head of a young girl in profile to the left, the portrait seems to wrap up the first Milanese phase of Leonardo's career with a highly personal version of a Saforsa period portrait, combining the strict profile formula with the delicacy of the pastel medium and transforming its heraldic quality into an image of pure beauty. And the use of the sofmato technique, or blurring technique, which we will discuss later on, being critically important in the timeline of Leonardo as it is used in future works, most famously for the Mona Lisa. So that wraps us up for Ghetto's uh, discussion of the work and brings a lot of interesting points to the forefront, which we will continue to run through later. But now let's see what else was going on at the time. In August 2008, the public began to find out about the possibility of a new work by Leonardo, which in the art world is not only rare, but is financially a really big deal. We are talking millions if it is found to be true, which uh, anybody that keeps on top of the art market will probably remember what happened when the Salvador Mundi went under uh, under the hammer at auction uh, probably like five or six years ago, which was a record breaker for a Leonardo, a record breaker for the art market, and ended up being sold to some Saudi Arabian museum, I think, or the Louvre bought it for their Saudi Arabian museum that they're building uh, but it hasn't really been seen since that auction like it hasn't really been discussed since um, but I'm sure I'll end up making a video on the Salvador Mundi because that's also a very there's a there's a there's a lot there there's a lot of different things that are there that need to be explored but anyway we'll keep talking about this one the work has its initial debut with a potential authentication of Leonardo in a limited edition book entitled Leonardo Infinito by Alessandro Vizzossi, an Italian art critic, Leonardo scholar and artist, with a foreword by Carlo Padretti, an Italian historian specialising in the life and works of Leonardo. Both experts in Leonardo, the scholars were overly excited to promote this new find in a book detailing the works of Leonardo with the most up-to-date scientific research, according to 2008 at least when this book was published. Padretti, in his introduction, brings special attention to Head of a Young Girl in profile to the left, detailing that although the sitter's profile is sublime and the eye is drawn exactly as it is in so many of Leonardo's drawings of this period, there are several things that are questionable or odd about the work. Like Kemp, Padretti remains suspicious of it being a fake and has several questions about the work. Many of these issues become common gripes of academics, the wooden panel backing, the costume of the sitter, specifically the purposeless triangular hole in the sleeve, and the lack of any known previous provenance for the work before it was sold at Christie's. But despite these questions, he asserts that the work constitutes, at least for the moment, the most important discovery since the early 19th century re-establishment of the Lady with an Ermine in Krakow as a genuine work by Leonardo. Very high praise indeed! Padretti's main thesis discusses the possibility of this being a portrait for a distant prospective groom believing that this could be of Bianca Maria Saforsa for Emperor Maximilian before their marriage in 1494. For only the introduction of a book discussing contemporary research on all Leonardo works, this discussion emphasises the high importance this work had to Padretti and Vizzossi, and something they felt the prospective buyers of this book, which retails for nearly 4,000 euros from Scripta Manata, a limited edition Italian publishing house that creates high craft and well-written volumes on art, they felt that this was what their audience really needed to know. Um, obviously, I have not actually read this book because I don't have 4,000 euros just hanging about uh, to buy this book. It's also no longer available in print from them, I don't think. I think they all sold out because it was a limited edition run. Um, so it is somewhere, I just have no access to it. Uh, but it definitely seems like an interesting book to the, the handful of people that managed to get a hold of it. Sounds like a great read, um, I'm really glad for you. <laughs> Alongside the first published picture of Head of a Young Girl on Profile to the Left, with the attribution of Leonardo, Vizzossi also proceeded cautiously, but argues that the level of purity and refinement in the creation made Leonardo's authorship the logical conclusion. He feels the preciseness by a left-handed artist means it could only be by Leonardo, 
which is furthered by Min Mina Gregori, who states that the execution of the work is the reflection of its Florentine character and the style of Leonardo's first years of activity in Lombardy. Although Vizzosi highlights that the use of parchment was unknown in Leonardo's oeuvre, he believes it fills a gap, as many other friends and artists surrounding Leonardo at the time were using parchment. He also believes that the parchment might have been used to create a more lifelike portraiture, following Pedretti's idea that it might be a marriage betrothal portrait. The potential sitter as a member of the Saforsa family, or a similar noble family, can be seen through aesthetic comparisons with Saforsa portraits by other artists of the time, which according to Vizzosi have not insurmountable differences. As for technical reasons why it may be a Leonardo, Vizzosi highlights the Leonardo-esque knot, which is similarly seen in Lady with the Ermine and the Mona Lisa, the quality of the work and the detail of the eye, which is incredibly important to Leonardo as a window of the soul to express the personality and the character of the sitter. So from Leonardo Infinito, we have a few ideas that can be discussed, and some speculations that have been made. Obviously, both believe it is a Leonardo, not a follower, due to the left-handed hatching, the use of the parchment, the character in the eye which allows a personality to be imbued into the sitter, the Leonardo-esque knot, and the level of detail in the work. They have also narrowed down which period it could be from, and a potential sitter and reason for the picture's creation, as a nuptial bride portrait for Emperor Maximilian of his future wife Bianca Maria Saforza, the niece of Duke Ludovico Il Moro of Milan. Please bear these names in mind for part two, as the family tree and the importance of these individuals will be discussed more prevalently then, but for now we will continue in 2008 and see what other academics have to say. Silverman, as the owner of the work, continues to try to gain followers of the Leonardo authentication by showing the work to more academics. One of these academics is Pietro Morani, head of Recolta Veneziana, an institution founded in 1905 which aims to establish a permanent and profitable bond for works on Leonardo by making the material available to scholars all over the world. Unfortunately for Silverman, Morani believed it was a copy and that there wasn't enough evidence for the attribution to Leonardo. This is one of the first sceptics that we hear of within Kemp's record. However, unfortunately with opening works up to the public, especially those still under investigation, everyone has their own opinion, which is necessary for debates or further research, but also allows for works to be very easily discounted if the limited release of evidence is enough for some people's initial judgments, and for some people no amount of evidence that is added on top will ever make them believe any differently. That initial judgement is everything for some people and they are not willing to see what other things are brought forward. They've made up their mind and that's it. But we will hear about more of them later on. On the 22nd of August 2008, the New York Times reported on the artwork which drew huge attention to the work and to Kemp and Silverman. Although Kemp felt it was too premature, as Kemp and Cote had not finished their technical and historical research to be able to answer every question, Silverman went ahead with it, mystifying himself as the friend slash buyer for the real owner of the work, a mysterious Swiss owner, uh, to deflect attention away from himself and the experts who had missed the work at Ganz's gallery and at the original auction. I don't understand why he did this but Silverman did what he did, so we move. The New York Times also revealed that the owner had been offered $50 million for the work, uh, an offer that was news to Kemp and seems very premature seeing as we have no idea whether it is or isn't a Leonardo yet, but there are people that are so obsessed with Leonardo that they're willing to take that risk, so I guess if you've got the money, take the risk. Whether this is true or not, also we have no idea. Just because it was reported in the New York Times doesn't mean it's factual truth, especially if it came from Silverman and he's trying to get a buyer. No idea whether that's really true or not. In September 2008, Nicholas Turner, who you might remember from earlier as being one of the academics that suggested to Silverman that it might be a Leonardo, meets with Silverman again, and Turner provided a report for Silverman concluding it was a remarkable drawing by Leonardo. Before we talk about the report, I want to highlight Turner's ending note on the report, which states that this report is based on research commissioned from me by the owner's agent at my standard daily freelance rate. I have no commercial interest in this work. How truthful this is, is hard to know, as the art world is very convoluted and money hungry, unfortunately. However, we will take Turner at his word and listen to the information from his report. Turner opens his report by stating it is one of two options, a Leonardo or a pastiche slash copy slash fake. For him, the level of quality and the evidence he divulges shows to him that it is a Leonardo. His first piece of evidence, which is also commented on by Ghetto in her 2009 afterward in Artes, uh, after her presentation speech, 
highlights that new research from carbon-14 tests carried out by the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich dates the parchment between 1440 and 1650, which fits within Leonardo's active artistic timeline and with his time within the Sforza court. However, this dating is also incredibly broad, as it will be for carbon dating, as it is always given within a 200-year period, as that's how the carbon deteriorates over time. They can see the increments in like a 200-year period. It's something along those lines. I need to do more research on carbon dating. I have read on it. It still confuses me a little bit, but I understand it. I think I get it. Maybe I'll do a video on different techniques that are used within art market evaluations, and that might end up being part of it as one of the things. Let me know if that's of interest to anybody, even if it's just a short little video on different parts of the authentication process. Although other material tests of this time had not occurred to keep the integrity of the work, a high definition colour scan of the work provided by Lumiere Technology allowed for Turner to look closely at the work to be able to see the extent of the left-handed shading and the way that the shading is used within the picture, such as the angle and the placement that match with other anatomical studies by Leonardo in the Royal Library at Windsor Castle. Alongside the left-handed shading, Turner believes that the level of intense concentration on detail from the artist could also be a key factor in an attribution towards Leonardo, as Turner states that the obsessive quest to record even-handedly the appearance of everything within the artist's view seemingly down to the last particle is a characteristic of Leonardo's creativity. Turner also believes that there is much to be said for the style and facial type of the sitter, stemming from other works that look similar to works that have been potentially attributed to the workshop of Verrocchio in Florence, where Leonardo trained and experimented in drawing different human profiles. However, the unusual mix of techniques, which became a key issue for the attribution later down the line, also became a key issue for Turner, who devised that although the use of mixed media, especially in the hair where pen and ink, brown wash and body colour from the chalk are used, may not be found in Leonardo's other portraits, it can be seen in his maps and plans for different inventions. The use of vellum is unprecedented for Leonardo for the use of a portrait, but for Turner, this alone does not exclude his authorship, as Leonardo does discuss the preparation and use of vellum within his treatise on painting as a support for drawing that can be sponged away and allow you to make a second attempt. Basically, you have it stretched out over a board, kind of like a canvas, and you can draw, but then you can sponge it off and start again if you need to, as a way of students practicing how to draw, rather than having to use paper leaf after paper leaf for it, which I think is quite interesting, and definitely the fact that it is mentioned at some point within Leonardo's discussions within treaties on painting also does help a little bit, especially if it's not really seen in any of his other artwork in his oeuvre. It is interesting that there is a discussion of it. Meanwhile, Kemp is emailing his initial thoughts to Silverman. Kemp at this point has not seen Turner's report or seen the actual work for himself due to the expense of flying to Switzerland to its safe housing. Kemp, like Turner, states that he doesn't receive payment for attributions or research and associated expenses, as he has had previous bad experiences in the past, which is why he had to source the money himself or through grants to get to Switzerland. At this point, Kemp emails that, My provisional judgement is that there is a fair chance the original drawing is by Leonardo from around 1490 and that it has been quite extensively reworked. I confess that, subjectively, what gives me the most uneasy feeling is the sheer prettiness of the drawing, but that is a feeling rather than an objective judgement. Thankfully, Kemp pitches the idea of being shadowed by the Science Television Workshop to film the research they were doing to be placed within a TV documentary, which I will link below, as it would be interesting for an audience to watch how the attribution of the work is undertaken by scholars, and it would be more accurate than doing a reconstruction of events later on. The Science Television Workshop granted funding and Kemp flew to Paris in October of 2008 to meet Pascal Cotte for the first time and to see his work, and then to Zurich to see the work itself. Kemp presents Cotte as inventively brilliant, sincere, open and innocent of the art world. A brilliant inventor who had created the multispectral scanning equipment which illuminates across 13 distinct spectral bands and photographs at intense levels of resolution. Ten of these spectral bands are on the visible light spectrum, so they go from the red through yellow all the way through the rainbow down into the violet, as well as two infrared which are at the top end and then one ultraviolet which are down at the bottom end. These two ends aren't seen by the human eye, so it allows an extra level of detail to be understood from the painting, which allowed for Cotte to make some strong conclusions to distinguish between the layers of restoration and the original work. From Cotte, we have a few conclusions. Firstly, the vellum and pigments had quite a tough life, 
hence the tears the ghetto discussed previously and the need for restoration work initially, and that the vellum had been cut jaggedly, causing a lot of damage, possibly through its removal from a manuscript or codex with three stitch holes. Secondly, there was extensive parallel hatching from Leo's distinctive left hand, which had been reinforced by a less subtle hand. Thirdly, there was various areas of restoration on the pastel areas with darker ink reinforcements done by a right-handed artist. And finally, that Cote could see that the right-hand palm had been pressed into the pigment on the cheek and neck, which is very characteristic of Leonardo, alongside a small fragmentary fingerprint, where Leonardo is known of using his palms to help with the melding of colours in different areas. From this research, we can highlight a few things. A possible provenance or origin point for the work, that it came from a codex or manuscript due to the stitch holes and the jagged edge of the work being removed. That the original artist was left-handed, but the restorer was right-handed, which can be seen by the direction and weight of the lines that is much easier to see and separate in the multispectral imaging layers. And that the palm had been used in the original creation of the work, something that Leonardo did with other works. After meeting Cotte, Kemp flew to Zurich with Giamarco Capuzzo, an art consultant who had arranged for the carbon dating testing as discussed earlier. Kemp finally gets to see the work in person, which he says zinged, a common characteristic for connoisseurs who earn their reputation through their eye, their ability to see the work as what it truly is just by looking at it, as an initial gut instinct before pursuing further research. Although the art market now does not rely solely on the connoisseur's eye to make a judgement, this zing is still viewed as critically important to making a convincing case for further investigation, and if a respected connoisseur believes that a work is authentic, that can affect the price widely in some cases, as I am sure I will end up covering at a future date. Anyway, Kemp has some very strong initial feelings about the work, which I will quote directly as he is the main Leonardo expert for this case, and it is important to know where he stands and what he feels initially for this work before further investigations into its provenance and dating occur. Here is a section of Kemp's statement. A young lady, or a girl on the cusp of maturity, is costumed for a formal portrait. The profile of her face is subtle to an inexpressible degree. No contour, no convexity, no hollow lapses into a steady mechanical curvature. The line is incised with stiletto-like precision, yet retains a living, breathing life. The evenness of her features nowhere falls into routine generalisation. These aspects of the faces of beautiful women, most extolled by Renaissance poets, rosetta lips and eyes like stars, are drawn with infinite tenderness. The iris of her pensive eye retains the translucent radiance of a living person. Her eyelashes are so fine as to elude a casual glance. The tip of her upper lip barely touches the pink curve of her lower lip with extraordinary delicacy. The beauty of the characterisation of the sitter's eye was particularly compelling, and it invariably produces a gasp of pleasure when shown in public lectures. So as we can see, Kemp really likes this work and really wants it to be a Leonardo. After viewing the work, Kemp wrote a report for Silverman and decided on writing a book with Cotte to combine the scientific and historical research as a joint venture for the attribution claim for Head of a Young Girl in Profile to the Left, which is very interesting. It's highly irregular for the attribution of different works that all of the evidence is presented with it in like a, a book form and like the scientific and historical research is brought together. Usually it's just asserted that it is true and then if people want to evidence it, they'll evidence it, mainly with the historical research, but to combine both the scientific and historical research together in a book form as you present the work is quite uncommon, I think, realistically. It's usually maybe like a paper that someone has written as an introduction to it maybe being the real thing. But the book in itself, like the idea of the book is quite interesting. Throughout 2009, the story for Head of a Young Girl and Profile to the Left goes quiet as Cote and Kemp work on their research for the book, ready for publishing in 2010. Silverman, on the other hand, tries to find an adequate event for Head of a Young Girl and Profile to the Left to make her debut in a public institution. Kemp, through the grapevine, hears that Silverman is trying to present the work at the European Fine Art Fair in Maastricht in the Netherlands which, according to Kemp, is one of the biggest and swishest high-prestige art events in the world. Kemp managed to persuade Silverman against the idea to exhibit here, highlighting that if the work was to be presented at this event, it may be seen by the art world as a cash grab for Silverman, rather than as an academic introduction for the work into the oeuvre of Leonardo. Kemp, as an alternative, suggested the Albertina in Vienna, 
who initially seemed interested in exhibiting the work, but the director decided against it, writing in Art News that no one was convinced it is a Leonardo. In March 2010, Kemp and Corte published their book, La Bella Principessa, the story of a new masterpiece by Leonardo da Vinci. La Bella Principessa was decided by Kemp, who originally suggested La Bella Milanese, due to the Milanese style of the work that fit within Leonardo's Milanese period. But Kemp's Italian friends recommended a different name as it sounded like a delicious veal dish. Unfortunately for Kemp and Cotte, the reviews for their book were largely unfavourable in the press. Many newspapers reported on the book, claiming that it didn't seem like a Leonardo to them, that Cotte's work was too complicated to be understood by an art history audience, and so either didn't matter or wasn't worth trying to understand. Alongside this, La Bella Principessa was having its first presentation at an exhibition in Gothenburg called And There Was Light, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, which many people disagreed with as they didn't believe in the attribution. Kemp, on reflection, is unsure if that exhibition was the right move, but hindsight is a wonderful thing. However, from Kemp's provenance research, a theory was discussed that if the work is a Leonardo, it was made during Leonardo's Sforza court employment which also produced The Last Supper and The Lady with an Ermine, a portrait of one of the Duke's mistresses, Cecilia Gallerani. If it is a Leonardo, it would be the only orthodox profile of an inner member of the Sforza family done by Leonardo. However, unfortunately for Kemp, the media flurry surrounding La Bella Principessa only got worse once David Gran released his article in July of 2010, discussing the work of Joseph Byro, a self-taught fingerprint expert and art restorer from Canada, who Kemp had asked to look at the partial fingerprint that was revealed in Cote's multispectral imaging scans. Biro, unbeknownst to Kemp before he gave Biro a chapter to discuss his research within their book on La Bella Principessa, had a rather shady past, as discussed by Gran, and much of his research has been dis debunked due to Gran's investigative article and by other fingerprint experts. However, this added a nail to the coffin in the media and their audience for the discussion of La Bella's authentication as a possible Leonardo, dragging away focus on the rest of the research presented in the book, as many media outlets focus solely on the salacious past of Joseph Bio and his fingerprinting business. This situation most likely be a tangential episode, as it is a very interesting and highlights the issues of the art market when it comes to authentication, new research, and why researching who to trust is very important when it comes to big promises. So now we come to a split in the road for the timeline of the work. Firstly, we have a timeline that brings to light the ownership provenance of the work and another that follows the future research of the work and where we stand now in 2020 with the authentication of La Bella Principessa. The next part of this episode will cover the first timeline and the next episode will cover the research endeavours from the past decade to see how the authentication of the artwork has changed and been challenged by other scholars and organisations. So let's continue with the first timeline. So La Bella Principessa has been exposed to the public, allowing for media and academic scrutiny and some huge valuations of the work to be thrown around about the work's true worth as a Leonardo. But what does this mean for its original owner and for Christie's who couldn't see its true potential? Well, as its sale took place in America, of course there's a lawsuit. On the 3rd of May 2010, a lawsuit is filed against Christie's New York by the original owner, Jeannie Marchig, an animal welfare philanthropist from Geneva who set up the Marchig Animal Welfare Trust in memory of her husband Giannino Marchig, a painter and known restorer of Leonardo's, the restored Leonardo's Madonna of the Yarnwinder that's housed in New York. From Marchig's testimony of events, Marchig approached Christie's in the late 1990s to sell the work to gain some funding for her animal welfare trust, which she had done on multiple occasions, most notably with the sale of Piero di Cosimo's Jason and the Queen Hypsipal with the Women of Lemnos, which sold in 2007 for $200,000. For the sale of Head of a Young Girl on Profile to the Left, she told Christie's what she had been told by her late husband, who was the first known owner of the work, that it was from the Renaissance, and in his opinion attributed to Galandio, a contemporary of Leonardo, who was known for his portraits. According to Marchig, her husband Giannino had the portrait before they married in 1955, and it was in an ornate, antique, Florentine wooden frame. The old master's drawing expert for Christie's, Francois Born, felt it was a 19th century German pastiche and gave the original estimate of $12,000 to $15,000 in New York. He advised that the frame be removed to make the object look more amateur, rather than like an Italian pastiche which may drive away bidders, which Miss Marchig eventually agreed to against her protest because she needed the money for her trust. After the Leonardo attribution had been made public, and Marchig started to make noise about her disapproval and outrage of Christie's treatment and behaviour at the point of sale, the international head of Old Masters, Noel Ainsley, contacted Marchig to try to resolve it amicably. 
He also visited Pascal Cotti in Paris to fortify and any scientific evidence for the lawyer to protect themselves against a potential lawsuit. Clearly, these discussions went great, as they still ended up in court. When it comes to court cases, most auction houses, especially the highbrow ones like Christie's, Sotheby's and the like, have terms and conditions that place limits on the extent to which they can be held liable for the opinions of the experts they used, and that many of these terms only apply to the buyers of the work, not the seller usually. In the lawsuit, Marcia claims that she advised Christie's of who the work is by from the information she was left with, and had the reasonable expectation that the drawing would be properly researched further than the snap judgment she believes Francois Bourne made. She filed against Christie's for the willful refusal and failure to investigate plaintiff's believed attribution, to comply with its fiduciary obligations to plaintiffs, its negligence, its breach of warranty to attribute the drawing correctly, and its making of false statements in connection with the auction and sale. Christie's wanted the case to be dismissed due to the statute of limitations being out on the work, however Marchick argued that the Leonardo's attribution was only being discussed publicly in 2009, so how could she have brought the case before that point? Christie's, in response, argued that the accurate attribution of the work was impossible due to the heavy layer of shellac that was placed over the portrait, which is used as like a varnish on older works like the Renaissance period, and that the new tech that had been recently used to make the Leonardo attribution was not available to them in the 90s when they made their original attribution, and finally that most of the proponents of the new attribution have a significant financial stake in their conclusion. If that's not throwing shade, I don't know what is. In January 2011, the case was dismissed on the grounds that Marchig had not told the statute of limitations, which basically means from my understanding, although I'm not a lawyer, so correct me if I'm wrong, that the statute of limitations for each of the five claims she made largely began around 1997 to 1998, when the sale occurred, rather than when the secondary attribution was made in 2009. Although her lawyers tried to argue the discovery rule, that if she didn't know that they had been negligent in their research, how could she file against them? Ultimately, the court sided with Christie's and dismissed the case. Christie's due diligence and evidence for the authorship had nev was never discussed in court, which seems a bit suspicious to me. I feel like that, that should have been considered in the trial, but also it's legally it's not necessary. But from a personal standpoint, I think that would have made the, the trial more interesting. But hey, uh, the legal system is the legal system. <laughs> in July 2011, Marchick appealed and partially changed the judgement, blaming Christie's for the removal and loss of the frame, which we only see in bad photographs now as it has been completely lost, which looks like a 19th century frame with Renaissance motifs. Marchick and Christie's settle out of court, giving an undisclosed donation to her animal charity. According to Kemp, Christie's uphold that it is a forgery if asked about it behind closed doors, according to whispers in the art world whilst other dealers and individuals within New York that missed the opportunity of owning the work, whether they saw it in the auction or at Ganza's gallery, argue that it was created by the husband as he was known as a great Leonardo restorer. This argument goes against much of the research that Kemp and Pascal have done, which for them proves it can't be a forgery from this time period. For Kemp especially, this forgery would require some very specific guesses at the hands of a forger before the 1950s to make something with materials that could survive carbon dating, and use techniques by Leonardo that have only been recently discussed and affirmed in academic literature. Jeanine Marchig argues that these claims of forgery are false, and uh, she was very involved in her husband's work life, and it would have meant that she had lied on the stand because she would have known it was a forgery, if it had actually been a forgery. Kemp also argues that the exercise of making a Leonardo forgery is pointless if you never tried to publish it as being the real thing. A pretty good point if you ask me. So this timeline brings us to the end of this first episode, so please let me know what you think and have discussions down in the comments. Do you think Marchick deserved a better trial? Do you think that the media fairly treated Kemp and Cote when they published their research? Do you think that the work is real, a fake, a forgery? Please be patient for part two, as these videos take a lot of reading and research and I'm getting used to how to do everything, so hopefully it'll be up soon, but I can't guarantee a time. Feel free to follow the Instagram and the Twitter for updates on what's happening, what stage I'm at, and any smaller news articles that aren't worth a full video. I hope to see you guys for part two, and uh, I will see you then. Bye!